Praise be to God, Lord, and cherish of the universe. And may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Brothers and if there are any sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, so brothers, uh, this is the second um, series um, in these stories of the prophets. And as I said last week, and in case for those who haven't attended last week, I just make a usual disclaimer every time we start the series. Um, I'm not a scholar of the Quran. I have no um, qualifications in Quranic scholarship. I am not a scholar of the Hadith of the Prophet I am of Arab origins, but I am not a scholar of the Arabic language of the Quran. And if you ask me a question on Fiqh, jurisprudence, I'm going to run out of those double doors. Because I don't understand anything about Fiqh, I don't understand anything about jurisprudence, and I have no intention of saying what is halal and what is haram, because there's a very threatening position for those who say what is halal and what is haram without the knowledge for that. The Prophet ﷺ said for those who make such judgments uh, without qualifications, they should prepare for their seat in hellfire. I have no intention of that. Uh, I'm a surgeon, that's, that's what I do for a living. Um, but the question begs itself on them, why are we here? And like I said the last time, brothers and sisters, if there are sisters listening, the stories of the prophets in the Quran are universal in time and place. The lessons from those stories are applicable to us in the 21st century, just as they were 1400 years ago. If they do not care whether you are living in the North Pole or in the South Pole, whether you're in New York or whether you are in Beijing, it makes no difference. The stories of the prophets are applicable. And our job today, brothers and sisters, is to take as much of these lessons, as much as we can, because we, we may not be able to take everything, but as much as we can, to take some of these lessons and apply them into our daily lives. So last week, brothers, we started with the story of the Prophet Adam alayhi salatu and we found that there were five steps that Adam taught us. And step one, that he was a Muslim. Step two, that he had the knowledge. Step three, that he had the experience. Step four, that he recognized when he made mistakes. And step five, is that he corrected the mistakes. And it was after these five steps were done, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Adam and his wife, go down and take the planet. And it's very important for us to realize, brothers and sisters, that before the creation of Adam, Allah in his infinite knowledge and mercy knew about those steps. And that Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, was created to be God's deputy, God's vicegerent on the planet. And so his coming out of the garden was not as a punishment. He was always going to go down. That's his place. That garden is not his place. The place is here. But he had to go through stages to be able to take the planet. And the lesson from here, brothers, is that before you undertake any project in your life, or any job in your life. Ask yourself, do I have the necessary knowledge? And do I have the appropriate experience to such an extent that if I make mistakes, I will recognize that I've made a mistake? Because the problem with a lot of the time, brothers and sisters, is that we don't even know we've made mistakes. We keep doing the same mistake over and over and over again without knowing that we are actually making the mistakes. And then, how to correct the mistakes. And that starts from the personal level, your personal relationship between you and Allah, and your personal relationship with your fellow mankind, people in mankind. And then that goes to the family. Then it goes to the wider society, it goes to your professional life, your careers, your businesses. 
and then it goes to the national level and even the global level. So some of you who may have studied economics, for instance, or have been up to date with what happens around the world, how many times in our lifetime, for those of us who are slightly on the older side, how many times in our lifetime have we seen cycles of bubble and bust economy? You know, the economy grows, 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 bursts, we go into a recession, into a financial crisis, then we start again, bubble, 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 burst, then we go down again. Many of you may remember the dot-com bubble that happened in 1999-2000, then the 2007-2008 financial crisis, and we're now in another financial crisis, and we were in a great depression in 1929 when the Wall Street stock market crashed. If anyone studied the, studies these crises, these financial crises, it's almost the same cause all the time. All the time is the same cause. Somebody is making the same mistake over and over and over again. Be it willfully or not, they're just keeping doing the same mistakes again. And why? Because they have not followed what Adam alayhi salatu wasalam laid down for us that this is, this is how we should run our lives. Look at the pandemic. Almost a hundred years ago, there was a similar pandemic, the influenza virus. And brothers and sisters, it's so fascinating that the same mistakes that were done were made in between 1918 and 1922 when the influenza pandemic struck the planet, we made the same mistakes again. We kept making the same mistakes again. Somebody is not, somebody's not having the knowledge the experience hasn't learned from the experience of others, so we keep making the same mistake over and over and over again. I cannot emphasize enough, brothers and sisters, how those five steps of Adam are so important in our lives. It's, it's just so important, and, and, and it, is, it is so clear the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His infinite wisdom, has taken Adam through those steps before handing over the planet to him. Today, we will have most, more things to learn from the Prophet Adam And this is something that is going to be very important also for our own lives. Brothers and sisters, when Iblis disobeyed Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a command. Bow down to Adam. They all bow down, the angels bow down. Jazakumullah, I am Allah granted the waters of paradise. When Iblis, when Iblis disobeyed, what was the first thing that happened? Allah asked him a question. Why did you not bow down when I commanded you to do so? Then Iblis responded, I am better than him. You created me from fire and you created him from mud or clay. Let's look at Adam. Allah gave Adam a command. Do not eat of the tree. When Adam and his wife ate, what did Allah say? Did I not tell you not to eat of this tree? So let's take them one by one. Let's take it step by step. I like things in steps. Maybe because I'm a surgeon, I do things in steps. Okay. But let's take things in steps. And I want us to see these birds. Step one. We put Adam. May Allah forgive me for putting the... I put him in very tiny letters. This is not even worth being put beside Adam. This hopeless creature. Okay? But we want to learn. Both were given a command. Command. Do not eat of that tree. Actually, Allah said, do not even come near it. Do not come near it and do not eat from it. And we said this last week, brothers, that 
The garden was full of so many good things, except one thing. You don't need to come near it. Same on earth. The halal is more than the haram on earth. The halal is more than the haram. There is so much halal on this earth that you don't even need to come near the haram, let alone do it. Okay? That's the rules around here. Do not come near the tree, do not eat of it, and do not even come near it. Command. And Iblis was given the command, bow down before Adam. Both, step two, both disobeyed. Please, brothers and sisters, be very clear on this in your mind. That on the, on the balance of law, on the balance of law, the disobedience of Adam was nowhere near the disobedience of Iblis in gravity. So, the disobedience of Iblis was much greater than the disobedience of Adam. Okay? No, 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 uh, no arguments about that. But in principle, Allah says, Adam disobeyed his law. Did you not say that? Wa'asa Adam? Anybody, anybody knows the verse better than me in Arabic? There must be people here who know the Arabic verses better than me. It's going to be terrible if I know them because I'm very bad at this kind of stuff. But the Quran says, Adam disobeyed his law. Okay? And he also disobeyed. Step three. Both were questioned. Both were questioned. Did I not tell you not to eat of the tree? That was a question. And why did you not bow down when I commanded you to bow down? Both were Question. So up till now, in principle, they are running on the same pathway, just at different levels, because Iblis' disobedience is greater, but they are running at the same direction beside each other. Where was the difference? The difference comes in step four. It's the response. Adam and his wife. Rabbana, the long name for Sarah. Our Lord, we have wronged our souls, we've transgressed against our souls. And if you do not forgive us, we will be amongst those who are lost. It was an immediate, the response of Adam and his wife was forgiveness. They are begging for forgiveness. What's the response of this idiot? What's the response of this idiot? Arrogance. Exactly, that's the word I want. That's the exact word I want. May Allah bless you. Arrogance. In fact, Allah called him arrogant. Stick bar. Arrogant. This is where <coughs> they differ. Brothers, Adam is teaching what happens when we pass through this because we all do this. Is there anyone here who has never disobeyed a command of Allah? If you have, raise your hand up and please come and sit here and teach us how you did it. My hands are down as well. We have all disobeyed Allah, isn't it? We've all disobeyed the command of Allah knowingly. We knew we were disobeying Allah when we did it. How many of us, how many of us got to this response? So Adam here is saying that the difference between 
us and Iblis is in our behavior after committing the mistake. For him, what did he get? When did they said, Rabbana Adha Rabbana Allah says, Fataba alayhi. Allah forgave him for the sin that he committed. Why is this one? Incurred the wrath and anger and curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, remember this. When Adam and his wife disobeyed, was there any argument with Allah? Did they argue? Did they say, well, you allowed Satan to do the waswasa? You allowed Satan to whisper into us? Was there any argument with that? None. Did they blame each other? Did the Quran have any record that Adam blamed his wife and they all started to blame each other? No. That is one of the major differences between us and our brethren, our brothers and sisters in humanity, the in Judeo-Christianity. So if you look at the, the, the Bible, for instance, in the book of Genesis, which the Jews and the Christians believe in, that when Adam was questioned by God over the eating of the food, Adam said, blame his wife. Adam said, it is the woman that thou gavest to me. She gave me to eat and I ate. And, I ate. and then when God questioned the woman, she blamed the serpent. She said, the serpent bade me eat and I ate. And everyone is blaming everyone. We differ with our brothers and sisters in humanity, the Jews and the Christians. We, we differ with them on this issue because in the Quran, such blame did not happen. Even if one was the first, even if one of them ate first and gave to the other, that blame did not. And hence, each of them took full responsibility for their actions. That's why Allah in the Quran said, did not say that Adam said, Dhalam to nafsi. No, it's both Dhalamna and Fusana. And therefore, both took full responsibility for their own actions without a blame to each other it's almost as if man and woman when it comes to sins and disobedience of Allah are equal in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hence both man and woman prayed simultaneously for the forgiveness of Allah so number one no blame Number two, taking full responsibility. Number three, no argument. Don't say, why me? Why did any of these, why didn't Adam and his wife say, why me? None of that. Brothers and sisters, when we commit sins, we must not argue with Allah we must not try to justify it because that's what this idiot did i am greater than him why are you asking me that to prostrate to someone who is lower than me in the substance of creation can you see the difference brothers between arguing with allah and asking a question last week we did that the angels asked Allah, are you going to put somebody in there who is going to cause mischief on the earth and who is going to shed blood whilst we glorify your name? That's not an argument. That's a question. Did Allah respond to them by cursing them? No. Allah said to them, I know what you don't know and then proved to them later that what they, what they were asking for, they can't do it. They don't know how to run the planet. They don't have the knowledge of running the planet. Whilst what this idiot did was argument, justifications. Oh, I did it because I live in the West. If I was living in an Islamic country, I wouldn't have done it. I hear that quite a lot sometimes. You say, oh, the, the, the temptations here, 
are too much. And that's why we did it. The justification is attempting to justify. No, there are no justifications. You take responsibility for it and you own up to it. You own up to it. And say, yes, I did it and I'm sorry about it and I beg God for forgiveness. There is no need of saying, I did it because of this. Oh my Lord, the, way, the reason I did it was because of my children. The reason I did it because of my wife. The reason I did it was because of my husband. Oh, I did it because of my parents. There was none of that here. Look at their response. The beauty of what Adam is teaching is there is no justification. There is no excuse. There is no argument. It is, I did it and I'm sorry. Then what's the response from Allah? Repentance. He has accepted his repentance. He will forgive him for what he has done. Hence, he is going out of the garden came with the pleasure of Allah. He went out of that garden with the pleasure of Allah. When, when, and Iblis left that garden with the anger of Allah. Iblis must have been shocked. Iblis must have been shocked. What? He repented. He asked for forgiveness. He didn't blame anybody. He didn't even blame me. Subhanallah, he didn't even blame me. And Iblis must have been shocked. And then seeing that Adam disobeyed the command and got away with it because there was no punishment for the disobedience of the command, Iblis must have run mental. All his hard work to make Adam and his wife disobey. All his hard work. All those efforts made to make Adam and his wife disobey. And then he got them to disobey. So he said, yeah, I got them to disobey. Now let him suffer like I'm suffering. And Adam cleans that out with one swipe of a sentence. Our Lord forgive us. And then he gets forgiven. He gets what? So every time I make the son of Adam or the children of Adam, Anytime I make them sin and put all this effort in making them sin, they can wipe it out by asking for forgiveness because they'll get it. And so Iblis has one major aim. It's not making us sin. It's making sure that when we sin, we don't ask for forgiveness. Because if we don't ask for forgiveness, then where are we going to be? We're on this side of the divide. We are on this side of the divide when we don't ask for forgiveness. Whilst if we ask for forgiveness, we are on this side of the divide. It's not the lack of sin. It is what happens afterwards. So brothers, when you put something up here that you may wish to know. We get what Adam's teaching. We talked about five steps. Now we're talking about how we get out of trouble. How we get out of trouble. Now, please. This issue of forgiveness is so paramount. If we don't get it right, we will lose on this earth and we will lose in the hereafter. Satan's job is to make us feel ashamed of asking for forgiveness. Or arrogant to ask for forgiveness or making us justify. Let's take the first few examples. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
tells us about three attributes that he has in the Quran. Three attributes that he has. One is Ghafil al them. Ghafil al them. One of the deeds of Allah is al Ghafur. Allah has its another name. These beautiful attributes, we need to get them right. Ghafil al the forgiver of one sin. Allah says, He will forgive you your sin. But before we go into this, what does Ghafar mean, for, which is translated loosely in, in the, uh, in the uh, English language as forgiveness? Actually, it doesn't mean that. The word Ghafar, the scholars of Arabic language, tell us that the word Ghafar means cover up. It's covered. So when you cover something, it's Ghafar. So in Islam, Ghafar means cover up. Then forgiven. There's another thing that the word Ghafla helps in Islam. Strength. Strengthens. Three things. Let's talk about this. Three things. When we make a sin, Allah, and we go to beg God for forgiveness, Allah covers the sin up. Done. It's over. Unlike us and some of our women with our children. You know when our children come and say we're sorry, what do we say? Right, but if you do it again, we haven't covered it. And we are prepared that, well, you did it last week. You know, the child's done this thing, and he does it, well, you did it last week. Okay, we haven't covered it up. We may have forgiven, but we haven't covered it. Here, it's completely covered. It's done. And then, you are forgiven for the sin, so there is no payback. You don't have to pay for it. Khalas, it's done. And then you get strength. When you ask Allah for forgiveness, He covers it up, He forgives you, and then He strengthens you. So forgiveness is a source of strength. We are weak because we don't ask for forgiveness. When you see yourself weak, it's because we are not asking for forgiveness. Forgiveness is a source of The Prophet Muhammad used to ask Allah for forgiveness how many times a day? At least a hundred, isn't it? At least a hundred times a day. Can you imagine the amount of strength that comes with that kind of plea for Allah's forgiveness? You can see the amount of strength that is that is just flowing into the Prophet Muhammad. But we'll come to just put this by the side. For now, there are some sins that we commit every time. We keep committing them. That one sin that we keep committing. There are some sins that become addictive. May Allah keep those away from us. And may Allah grant shifa to those who have addictive sins. Do not look down on your brothers and sisters who may have addictive sins. Do not look down on them. They may be better than us on the Day of Judgment. And because of these addictive sins, Shaitan comes to you and says, when you did it the day before yesterday, you begged for forgiveness from Allah. You didn't last a day or two, and you did it again. Then you asked for forgiveness again. Then you didn't last a day or two, and you did it again. 
the same sin over and over and over and over again. Then Shaitan comes to you and whispers, you think you can deceive Allah? You should be ashamed of yourself. You're done for. Don't ask for forgiveness. It's useless. Allah says to you, Shaitan is a liar. I am ghafir al them. Keep talking to me. Keep coming back to me. Keep asking for forgiveness. Just keep going. Don't stop. Keep coming back to me. There are some of us, I don't say some of you, I say some of us, I'm included as well, who commit many sins. God for example, the forgiver of one sin. al ghafur the oft forgiven. What does oft forgiven mean? From one Friday to the other, if you did your Friday prayers properly last Friday, and you did your Friday prayers a week down the time, one Friday to one Friday, and you beg for forgiveness, cleans the sins between two Fridays, isn't it? Is that not, is that not the deal that we have, provided we ask for forgiveness in the correct way? Yeah? Okay. Between one Friday and the other Friday, we committed many, many, many sins. And she then comes. Look at how many sins you committed. You can't even count. You know, brothers, I tried it once. I tried to count the number of sins between one Friday and the other. Before the first Friday evening was over, I stopped. Because I was like, this is, I'm like, it's too much. If we're really talking about sins, it's just getting too much. It, we, we, it's, it's many. And it builds down on you. And then Shaitan comes and says, <laughs> look at how many sins you have done. Look at them. If between one Friday and the other, look at what you've done. Can you imagine what you've done in a, in a year? Can you imagine what you've done over a lifetime? And he comes to you. God will forgive you that. You should be ashamed of yourself. You shouldn't even ask Allah for forgiveness. Then when you say, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I'm, I'm, maybe I'm gone. Then Shaitan comes to stage two. He tells you, but don't worry, you're justified. You were busy at work. Huh? You were busy. Somebody at work make you, made you angry. How many of us don't get angry at work? All of us get angry at work every now and then. Sometimes I annoy my brother, Dr. Kalim at work. Sometimes I lose. Huh? We all do that. So, somebody made me angry at work. So what's, he, what's Shaitan getting you to do? To justify, to justify, what you've done. So that you can sleep well, because Shaitan wants you to sleep well too. Because if you sleep well, you won't ask for forgiveness. You're not going to feel the pain. She so says, look at what you've done. You've gone so many, forget about it. But life doesn't have to be that bad. After all, if Allah really loved you, He would have prevented you from doing this. So you're now getting to stage three, arrogance. And many of us Muslims don't pass stage one. Stage one, which is, I'm afraid of asking for forgiveness. Some go into stage two, justifying just what they've done so they can sleep well at night. And then a few get to stage three, where they start to be arrogant. Yes, it wasn't my fault. Why should I ask for forgiveness when it wasn't my fault? After all, he could have stopped it if he wanted to. When you commit so many sins like this, and shaitan comes to you and says, there are too many. Allah will not forgive you. Allah tells you, Shaitan is a liar. I am al Ghafur. I am al Ghafur. I am the oft forgiven. And I'll forgive you all. And there's a beautiful thing that we are taught, brothers and sisters, that Allah says, My servant comes to me with a mountain of sins. A mountain of sins. Because he knows I'll come to him with a mountain of forgiveness. There is no amount of sins one can make that is too many for Allah to forgive. That's why he is al ghafur Then comes the third attribute, al ghafar Now al ghafar brothers and sisters, means the all-forgiving. 
He forgives all sins, including major sins. Some of us may have committed major sins, top flight sins. Shaitan comes. <laughs> You are committing minor sins before. This one is too major. It's too major. You think Allah is going to forgive you for that? Look at, look at the havoc and mess you've caused when you've committed this major sin. And he takes you through the three stages again. Stage one, he makes you feel too ashamed to ask. Stage two, justification. Stage three, arrogance. He takes you through the three stages again. Allah comes to you and says, Shaitan is a liar. I am Allah. Ghaffar. I forgive all. So much so, brothers, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Musa alayhi salatu wasalam to Pharaoh, hmm? Pharaoh, he said to him, talk to him gently. Talk to Pharaoh what? Gently. That he may what? That he may self-purify himself, that he may purify himself. Giving Pharaoh the chance to do what? To repent and ask for forgiveness. It means that if Pharaoh had asked for forgiveness, Allah would have forgiven him. Now look at the sins of Pharaoh. Murder. Remember, kill all the firstborns, kill all the males, enslave the females, enslave an entire nation. And what's worse? What did Pharaoh say to his people? Anna, Rabbukum al -ala. I am your Lord, I am the one, I am the creator, I am the one who's done everything. It can't get worse than Pharaoh. What the brothers, it can't get worse than Pharaoh. That's why he's, that, that, by the way, the, the word Pharaoh is a title. But just for that particular person, it's now become like an insult. You know, you want to insult somebody who's arrogant and say the pharaoh. Don't come and tell me outside you're Egyptian, you're from Pharaoh's land. Because every time I give this, well, you're from Egypt, yeah, oh, Pharaoh. Oh, why Pharaoh? Okay, we take it easy, we're not Pharaohs, okay? We used to have them, and we have a few of them these days, okay, still hanging around, uh, but we're not, no, we're not Pharaohs, okay? But it's become that title of evil. To the extent that when Abu Jahl in the battle of Badr was killed, what did the Prophet ﷺ say? The Pharaoh of this Ummah has died. He called him the Pharaoh of this Ummah. It can't get worse than Pharaoh. A man who commits genocide, a man who commits atrocities, a man who calls himself God, a man who forces people to worship him. And yet, Allah was going to forgive him if he asked for forgiveness. Brothers and sisters, you and I don't have the facilities of Pharaoh to even make the sins of Pharaoh. We don't even have the facilities. We can't even do what Pharaoh did. We don't even have that power. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, we don't have the facilities. And Alhamdulillah, we don't have the power to do what Pharaoh did. So if Allah was prepared to forgive Pharaoh, is it you and I that he is not going to forgive? Is it you and I? What's wrong with us? We get worried, I'm not sure Allah has forgiven me. I'm like, what do you mean by you're not sure Allah has forgiven me? Have you done a tawbah? Yes, I've done tawbah, but I'm not sure. Really? So Allah says he's going to forgive you. If you are Dutawa, and then you tell him, well, I'm not sure. Really? What is this lack of confidence? He did not see the Adam and his wife and the way they said they're forgiveness. We have wronged and transgressed our souls, and I please forgive me if the Arabic is not coming up properly. But we have transgressed against our souls. They know, they have the knowledge, they know that if they ask for forgiveness, Pharaoh was going to be forgiven if he had asked for forgiveness. What is it that you and I have done that is that can be worse than that? 
the prophet Noah tells his people just before their destruction and before Allah destroys a nation what, the, what do you think that nation has done? Does that nation do one sin? Nah. You won't get destroyed for one sin. Did they do many sins? Nah. That's not enough. They must have done what? Major, major sins. Repeatedly. So what does Noah tell his people? Before their destruction. Ask Allah for forgiveness. Innahu kaina? Ghaffara. Innahu kaina? Ghaffara. Did he say innahu kaina ghaffurun rahim? No. Innahu kaina? Ghaffara. No, he's telling his people, you've done major sins. But do not, do not feel that Allah will not forgive you and that he will do what? He uses the word ghaffar, he uses the, the, the attribute of ghaffar. And then look at what Noah promises his people. That if you ask Allah for forgiveness, what he's going to do? He will send on you the rains, the source of wealth. And he will increase you in sons, the source of what? Strength. Back here. It is the source of strength. The woman is weak because the Ummah has stopped asking for forgiveness. The family is weak when the family stops asking for forgiveness. We as individuals are weak when we stop asking Allah for forgiveness. That's what Adam stopped. And when the sin is done, no justifications, no arguments, no arrogance. Just admit it, ask for forgiveness, and move on. <clears throat> now, let us look at another one. Another. Let's join this. Let's join this up a bit more. Repentance. Well, tell them. Even the word repentance is not a good it's not a, it doesn't do justice to what Tawbah really means. For us to have that forgiveness, first thing is admission of guilt. No justifications, no arguments, admission of guilt. Second, the prayer and the plea. And Adam has taught us how to do it. He's given us a prayer that we can use. The third thing is, you make a plan. On how not to do it again. But sometimes our plans fail. And sometimes that happens with the addictive sins, is that the plans fail. So you need to keep working on it, you need to keep strengthening yourself. And then you get the repentance. And then you get the forgiveness. And the forgiveness means you get covered up, forgiven, and strengthened. But there's another one that you're going to get, which I'm very interested in. I'm very interested in this fourth one. When you ask Allah for forgiveness, what have you done? What have you just done? You say, Astaghfirullah. What have you just done? You've spoken to Allah, isn't it? You've spoken directly to Him. When you speak to Allah, what have you done? You've entered into His presence, isn't it? You've come begging into His presence. Allah has a name, brothers. Allah is Al Ghani, the supreme in wealth. You cannot enter His presence and walk out. Without a reward. You must get a reward. You've entered his presence. You don't walk out without what? A reward. So you must have a reward. So let's get this out. You, you committed a sin. Then you admitted the guilt. No justification, no argument, no arrogance. Then you begged for forgiveness. You received the forgiveness. You made a plan. Allah covers it up, 
forgives you, strengthens you, and rewards you. So what started with a sin ends with a reward. That's the deal. That's one of the reasons, brothers. You know Omar al Khattab al Farooq, Omar. When he goes one way, Shaitan goes the other. Because anytime Shaitan makes Omar sin, what does it end up for Omar? It ends with the reward. Because Omar understands what Adam taught him and what Muhammad taught him. That if I sin and I beg for forgiveness, I will get a reward. So Shaitan says, anytime I make him sin, the man gets rewards. I'm a source of reward for Omar. Now I leave him alone. There's no need. If I, if I can't get him to hell, then at least I don't want him to have rewards. Brothers, this is not a blank check to commit sins, no. It is not a blank check to commit sins. But it is the way the system works. That if you commit the sins, because we will commit sins, we will make mistakes, it's part of being human. It's part of being human. We're not the angels. We must make mistakes. But the end result of your mistake must be reward. So brothers, between the mistake, between the guilt and the reward is this system. Between the guilt and the reward is this system. You must admit the guilt, no justification, no arguments, no arrogance. Try to create a plan not to make it happen again. Ask for forgiveness sincerely. It, you must feel it in the heart, brothers. You must feel it in the heart. You know, brothers, many of us have the tasbih. And I warn brothers and sisters with this. In the way we ask for istighfar. If I was to take this bottle of water and go to my brother here and just pour it on top of him, just, just sh shower him with water. Sorry, 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 sorry. What's he gonna do? He'll stop filming me and take the water and I'll tell you what sorry looks like. And he's younger than me, so he's healthier than me, so he's stronger than me. He'll... I'll be finished, isn't it? But if I so look at how many sorries I told him. I must have told him twenty sorry, 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 sorry. Twenty. Must have said it twenty times. But if I poured the water on him and said, oh, I'm really sorry, please forgive me. I only said it how many times? Once. What's he going to do? He'll say, brother, don't worry about it. Don't worry, it's fine. You see the difference when I said it 20 times versus when I said it once. The problem, brothers, is that some of us, I didn't say some of you, some of us, think it is, it is, yeah. Stop, 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 and in my mind, biryani, chicken, meat, what am I going to eat today? This man really made me angry today at work. Stop, 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 stop. That is not istighfar, brothers. That's not istighfar. If you want to, I, I'm, I'm not here to discuss whether the, the use of the beads, that's for those in jurisprudence to, to discuss. I'm saying that when you say astaghfirullah, try to put some mind in it. Try to put some heart in it. It's like if someone just did what I said, just poured things on you and said, sorry, 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 You're not going to accept it. That's not an apology. That is not. It reminds me of one of the politicians recently, uh, Mr. Jacob Rees Monk, uh, went to the civil servant's office. And when he didn't see the civil servants physically in the office, he wrote one thing that said, I'm sorry not to have seen you. No, he wasn't sorry, and that wasn't an apology. It was just like, I need to see you next time. You know, it's his way of saying why you're not at work physically. Okay? Uh, and he's been criticized by the opposition and those on his side, and they have these fights in parliament, as you all know. But it is the way you use the word sorry. Did you really mean it? Or did you just say it for the, for the sake of saying it? With Allah, remember that Allah knows what's in your heart. 
Allah knows what is in your heart. So when you ask for the istighfar, for this system to work, for sin, for sin to end in reward, there has to be some sincerity. And that's the difficult bit. Is to train us. Now this is not going to happen overnight, brothers and sisters. So don't, don't put yourselves, oh, but tomorrow I can't do it. The following day. Because that's what Shaitan will come and tell you. Huh? Were you sincere? Were you sincere? Today? You were sincere today, but you weren't sincere yesterday. Look, you can't do it. Just forget it. By the way, did you not say stuff a lot hundred times yesterday on your tasbih? Shaitan will tell you, yes I did. Okay, khalas, it's done, over. What's he trying to do, to do to you? He's making you justified. He's taking you to justification. Step one is being ashamed. Step two, justification. Step three is arrogance. He's trying to take you through the steps. Don't stop. Remember, brothers and sisters, that the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, did not go from A to B. They did not go from when they don't reach the level, the high level they reached in Iman overnight. They took time. So be gentle on yourself as well. Be gentle on yourself. We will stumble. We will stumble. Okay? We will continue to stumble. But when we stumble, we pick ourselves up and again we keep going at it. What we should never do is lose hope. Hopelessness is forbidden in Islam. And who taught us that? We will come to the particular prophet who taught us that. There was a prophet who taught us that. The prophet Yaqub. The prophet Jacob. When he told his sons, no one is hopeless of the mercy of Allah except those who rejected faith. The kafir. No one is hopeless of the mercy of Allah except those who rejected faith. The kuffar. No matter what has happened, no matter the number of times you've done it, the system will work. It's a universal system. It will work. Just keep going at it. Never, ever, ever lose hope. That's what shaitan wants. He wants you to be hopeless, move into depression, then he starts to help you, in quotes. By making you oh, justified, come on, it's fine. You've tried your best anyway. It's not fair. Come on, how can you be judged the same way as you would have been judged if you were in another country? Or living in another time? I mean, did the Sahaba have WhatsApp? Did they have Facebook? Not that all this is bad, I have WhatsApp, I use it a lot. It's not, it's not the problem. We have social media. Why are you comparing yourself with the Sahaba? Oh, don't worry. That's what justification. It's a very dangerous thing. I'll talk a bit more on cover up before I, before I finish, brothers. It's a beautiful scenario that our scholars teach us about how Allah covers up our sins. So hush, hush. Nobody's going to know about it. Now, on the day of judgment, on the judgment. A believer stands in front of his Lord and the book is opened and all his sins are there. The Prophet says that some believers would rather be thrown into hell than have their sins that are in the book exposed. They would rather go to hell quietly than have their sins exposed because now it's in front of everybody. And here is the believer shivering. I am going to get exposed. And then a scream happens. A scream just appears. And Allah talks to the believer. Only him and his Lord. No one else hears. And Allah asks, what are you afraid of? And says, my Lord, my sins are in front of me. And I'm about to get exposed. And Allah says to him, did I expose you on earth? Did you not ask for forgiveness? Did I expose you on earth? And the believer says, My Lord, you did not expose me on earth. And Allah says, Then I will not expose you here. It's only between you and I. Nobody else listens. 
It's just you and I. Your sins are forgiven. Go to your paradise. Nobody hears about it. There's another hadith that Musa alayhi salatu wasalam in the middle of the desert was begging Allah for water. And the water didn't come up. And usually when Musa begs for something, he gets it. So Musa realizes alayhi salatu wasalam that something is wrong. So he says to Allah, why haven't, why haven't you granted our prayers, Ya Allah, for the water that we begged you for? And Allah says to him, there's one member, there's one of you in your camp who has been committing the sins for 40 years, never asked for forgiveness. Kick him out of your, pull him of your, uh, of your camp. So Musa alayhi salatu wa sallam returns to the camp, so like outward. One of you is causing this problem. He has been committing these sins for 40 years, has never asked for forgiveness, and we're going to have to find out who that is. He came out of the camp. The man in the camp starts to shiver. He's going to be exposed. They're going to find out who he is. So you know what the man does? He begs Allah, Allah in his mind. He says, oh Allah, forgive me Allah. What's he afraid of? He's afraid of the exposure. Oh Allah, forgive me. And then the rain falls. Musa alayhi salatu wa sallam then says to Allah we haven't kicked anybody out of the camp and you've sent the rain my lord and Allah says the man begged for forgiveness and in my delight that he's begged for forgiveness I send the rain so Musa says oh my lord show me who this man is that you are so forgiving of him that I may go and celebrate with him. So Allah says, Musa, I did not expose him for 40 years of sin. I will not expose him when he is asking for forgiveness. And so Musa will not know who that man is. It's a beautiful thing, brothers, this covering up. The last, I, I started last week by saying that if some of you knew the kind of sins I have committed and are com and still commit, you wouldn't come here to listen. You're like, go sort yourself out before you come and talk to us about systems and, and steps and all this. And the reason is, I keep praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cover me up. Now brothers, next week, I'm going to go a little bit more in detail on this issue of covenants. Because Adam alayhi salatu wasalam teaches us a beautiful thing about this covenant issue. The beautiful thing that Adam teaches us about covenant. So today, brothers, we saw one of the major differences between what happened with Adam alayhi salatu wasalam and Iblis. Both were given a command, there was disobedience on both sides, there was questioning on both sides, but they differed in their response. <coughs> Adam taught us, we don't argue, we don't justify, we don't become arrogant, we accept full responsibility, no blame culture, and we beg Allah for forgiveness. And we went through the three attributes that we see in the Quran of Ghafir al-Dhamb and al-Ghafur and al-Ghaffar, that take all forms of sins, these three attributes of Allah take all forms of sins that a human being can do and how we can get out of it. And how inshallah we start with a sin and end with a reward. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covers up our sins, how he forgives us and how he strengthens us. And if we're weak, it's because we're not asking for forgiveness enough. We also said that forgiveness for this system to work between sin and reward, there has to be some sincerity and that this sincerity is something you have to work on it doesn't come overnight okay it will come with time you need to build it up it's it it's something you build all your life and every stage of your life you should be better getting better at it you need to keep building that resilience of maintaining that sincerity and i'll stop here brothers and sisters and we'll entertain any um comments questions but most importantly, any corrections. So if I've made a mistake, please, by all means, feel free to correct.